Good morning. This is Eric Kennedy with the Kentucky School Boards Association. And it is Friday morning as I sit here and film this extremely early on Friday morning. It was a very late night last night. The General Assembly met all the way up to and just slightly past midnight before everything wrapped up. Um, so much happened and the news articles that you will see today go into detail about the ins and outs and the procedures and so many different things, many of which are pretty unusual at, uh, as sessions go. There were all, they, all of the articles will be talking about all the other bills that aren't education related. <clears throat> and during the process yesterday, there were so many committee meetings and amendments to our main education bill, Senate Bill 1, that we wanted to send something to all of our school board members and superintendents today that really focused on what you most need to know. Not talking about things that were in it that came out or things that were changed, but really saying at this moment, what passed, what is now the law, when something will take effect and what you most need to know. Uh, we know that you're overwhelmed as everyone is. So we didn't want to send you something very long to read. And we think that a pretty short video, that I'll try to keep it short, where we actually pull the bill up on the screen and highlight things and walk through it with you will be the most helpful thing um, for if you can find some time to watch it today or over the weekend. So I will share my screen. Okay. On your screen now, you should see Senate Bill 1. Up in the upper right-hand corner of the bill, you will see that at the very end, it says VO. That means veto override. So this is the version of the bill that became law and is now law and in effect as of last night before midnight. The governor vetoed part of this bill, and then the House and Senate came back before they closed, before midnight, and voted to override the veto and pass Senate Bill 1 um, over his veto. They did that. Uh, because it has an emergency clause, it is now a law. And so in the bill, anything that talks about within 14 days of this taking effect or within five working days of this becoming a law, that clock is already ticking. And I'll talk about that later. And so as we just scroll down through the bill, we'll go section by section pretty quickly and talk about some of the finer points of this. As you see, there's uh, section one. This deals mostly with the mask mandate that was in a regulation for daycare and childcare settings. Section one does not involve schools too much. So honestly, we will scroll right on past it. Here, section two, uh, as you see on your screen, this section of the bill, uh, I believe the word they use is, let me find out, repeal or rescind. They basically repeal the State Board of Education's mask mandate that was in a regulation uh, for the past several weeks. So there again, section two, uh, you can see it there. It names the regulation. This was the State Board of Ed regulation requiring masking in all of our public schools. It says there, this is the administrative regulation uh, shall be null, void, and unenforceable five working days from the effective date of this act. I'll highlight that there. The effective date of this act was yesterday uh, because of the emergency clause and they filed it uh, and finished it up before midnight. So today, Friday, I believe is the first working day from the effective date of the act. Therefore, I believe, and this is, I have no legal authority to interpret anything, but I believe that the five working days will end and wrap up on Thursday of next week. The regulation, the mask mandate will stay in effect until that time. And so nothing immediately changes about masking in our schools uh, until Thursday. When that does, this bill, you can see the words on your screen, nothing here says that every board shall have a meeting and shall decide to do one thing or the other about masking before that date. Uh, this simply says that the mask mandate in that regulation no longer will apply at that time. Many school boards across Kentucky, even before this mask mandate went into effect weeks ago, had already adopted your own mask mandate. You were already requiring masking anyway. If that was the last action that your board took in your district, you simply revoke, uh, go back to that. You sort of default back to that status that is still there. So to explain that more clearly, when the state mandate falls away, uh, assuming it does on Thursday, for any district that already required masking, you would fall back to that and continue requiring masking. 
Several districts have already announced on social media last night and already even this morning that that is the case for them and masking will continue anyway. Uh, some school boards and superintendents had already decided um, even last night that they would, I believe one school board may have even voted last night in a meeting that even if this passed as it did, they would continue requiring masking in their schools. Uh, school boards can meet anytime before Thursday and do you know, one thing or another on this issue. If you don't do anything and you never had a local mask mandate and then Thursday comes and goes and the state mandate falls away, you would basically be in the situation you were at the very beginning of the year, right before the school year started, before the mask mandate was there. Uh, of course, this uh, is a very, uh, this issue is getting the most attention, even though I believe other parts of the bill in some ways are more important um, for school operations and finances. Uh, we would just say, as you consider this at the local level in your district, there are a lot of things to take into account. There are a lot of valid concerns to take into account, not only uh, what families and students and staff may want, uh, what your community may want, but this is also something to discuss with your local school board attorney, your insurance carrier and their attorney, and also potentially even your workers' comp insurance uh, provider. Many districts use the same provider across Kentucky, uh, not everyone. So reaching out to them as well as your local hospital, your local health department, getting a lot of feedback to know what is best for your community given your circumstances right now, uh, you're uh, including the legal situation. Uh, we would just encourage everyone to reach out to all of those folks and those agencies and have a discussion about this, no matter what your decision will be uh, when the state regulation falls away. Section three there at the top of your screen says recognizing uh, all of the concerns about schools operating during COVID, the General Assembly requires each district to have a COVID-19 school operations plan in place as of the effective date of this act. So that's a, that date is already here. You might think, well, how in the world can we create a plan as of last night? The good thing is the way this is described, we believe is basically describing something that all districts we believe already have in place and have already filed with the Department of Ed and already have on your website. Because in order to request your ESSER funds from the last round of federal COVID money, you already had to develop a plan for how you would open in-person school this year and how you would safely operate in order to request your ESSER money. The deadline for that has already passed. And we believe that basically the plan you already have uh, that you probably already have on your website because that was already required is what this is describing. Of course, it says you have to follow with KDE for informational purposes only. They don't have to approve it uh, and you can change it at any time. Section four at the top of your screen says within 14 days of the effective date of this act. Uh, frankly, I haven't counted that up, but that will be you know, roughly two weeks away. The State Department for Public Health shall develop a COVID-19 test to stay model school plan that may be implemented by school districts in whole or in part. So most of this bill is optional or most of this bill is not things that you have to do. It is just things you may do if you want in your district. This is no different. Your district does not have to adopt a test to stay protocol for students and staff trying to limit quarantines. Uh, you may explore that if you want to. Many districts already have. Many districts have announced all throughout this week that they have worked that out with their local health department and a testing provider to do that. Uh, we don't think that the capacity is necessarily there right now for every district to do this completely statewide. But now that it is clear there was a lot of confusion whether this was even allowed or not, frankly, by some uh, local communities. Now that this bill has passed and it's clear that it will be allowed, within 14 days, the state will have a model plan that districts may look to and may use in whole or in part. Uh, you can adopt that or take parts of it. Now we believe we will be able to increase testing capacity with providers uh, now that there is certainty that this is allowed. As you can see there, this is telling the State Department for Public Health what they will have to do when they create this plan that districts may or may not use. It says the model plan shall include as an alternative to quarantining, an on-site testing option that allows non-symptomatic students uh, with school-related exposures to remain in school if they test negative for a certain number of days. The plan is going to have guidance. Um, it says shall provide guidance for contact tracing and quarantining based on whether or not exposed individuals were masked, non-masked, or fully vaccinated. Now that is very important when we go back to the discussion about your masking decision. 
It is our understanding that everyone that is already using a test to stay model right now can only do that because there is universal masking. In other words, basically this really only works if everyone is wearing masks in schools. Certainly we believe that will remain the case. And when the state comes out with this model plan, we are almost certain that will be part of it, that you could only possibly take advantage of this kind of a plan and procedure if everyone is wearing masks. So that is another thing to take into account. If one of the biggest issues facing your district is the quarantines of students, uh, this is something that if you wanted to use test to stay to address that issue, then you may have to require universal masking at the local level in order to do so. So that's another thing to take into account on that decision. Very important, a school, as you can see at the top there, a school district's local health department shall provide assistance uh, that means it's a requirement. The local health department shall provide assistance in implementing a school district's test to stay plan or any other local school board approved COVID-19 plan for masking, contact tracing, and quarantining, including the location and procurement of services. The Department for Public Health at the state level shall provide support to local health departments in assisting the school districts. That paragraph right there is very, very important. Essentially, we believe that what this means is that now local school districts to a great extent will be able to make their own plans, including their approach to contact tracing and quarantining. One thing under this, that key sentence there, that local health departments will be providing you assistance with developing these plans. A lot of school districts all across Kentucky and especially along the Indiana border, um, this week in the last few days have brought up the plan that the state of Indiana has put in place from their governor in an order, in an executive order to his state health officials. I haven't, I'm not up to the, on the details because of course it's in another state, but my review of that seems to indicate that in Indiana now, because of a state uh, order over there, that if students are identified in contact tracing as being possibly a close contact to someone who tested positive, that they don't have to quarantine and go home at all if they were masked, and if they test negative and have no symptoms, uh, that's my understanding of it, but that may not be the full, I'm sure it's not the full story. So a lot of folks have said, well, now that this is in place and school districts can develop their own plan, we're interested in doing something like that, that our school district or even all of the school districts across our region may get together and all of our boards may develop and vote in a plan for contact tracing and quarantining rules that will be like what they have in Indiana. Uh, there again, as you discuss that and as you uh, look at your work with your local health departments, keep in mind that another key part of that working in Indiana is the universal masking. And so if any school district is interested in doing that to keep kids in class as much as possible to limit quarantines, then that ties back to your decision on requiring masking in order to take advantage of that kind of plan. Beginning at the top of your screen there, section five of Senate Bill 1. Uh, this talks about the remote instruction days. The key words are notwithstanding any other statute or reg to the contrary. Let's read that. A school district may temporarily assign students at the school, grade, classroom, or student group level to remote instruction due to significant absences of staff or students related to COVID until December 31st, 2021, basically the end of this semester. It is very important, it is, it is not just that we're using a different term for something. We at KSBA discussed with KDE staff several days ago that there is a very important distinction between NTI, the non-traditional non -traditional instruction program, and all the other forms of learning at home, any kind of virtual or remote learning. The NTI program is very specific in state law, in regulation, you have specific plans about it. It was always intended to be when an entire district closes. Uh, many folks over the last few days in working with legislators came to sort of a consensus that we've already gotten so far away since the start of the pandemic using NTI from what it was originally created and designed for that all this time we've kind of been putting a square peg in a round hole. They said, why don't we start creating a new category, a new distinction of something slightly different that's more what we actually need right now something that would allow you to do one school going remote or even one classroom or all of the third grade going remote if you had a certain teacher shortage or whatnot. That is what this language is all about. So this is a new category of a kind of remote learning 
where different levels, different groups of students could be assigned into remote learning for certain periods of time. Next piece of language that's important, with prior authorization from the local school board, the decision to temporarily assign students to remote instruction shall be at the discretion of the superintendent. It shall be no longer than is necessary to alleviate the student and staff absences. And keep in mind, this category of remote learning, it always has to be in some way tied to and in, because of COVID-19, and that will be important later. There you can, now, there was a lot of confusion on this point. I'm going to talk about how many days you have. That highlighted paragraph there on your screen, remote instruction may be provided to a school, grade, classroom, or a group of students up to 20 days under this section. No school district shall utilize remote instruction for more than 20 days. A school district shall not temporarily assign every student in the district to remote instruction unless all students in the school district are located in a single school facility. Of course, we have a few school districts that truly are basically one school in one building. Okay, that paragraph, how many days you have, that was a lot of confusion over the last few days. Frankly, the first time I read it, I thought it meant one thing. Then some questions from the Department of Ed and some questions with legislators indicated that they intended it to work another way. Even just last night, when they were voting on this bill, there was a little bit of confusion back and forth. But this version of the bill that is now in effect, I believe the way that they explained it and the way they all intend it, apparently the way that everyone now agrees it will work, is that every school district will get 20 days during which anyone in the district can be assigned to remote instruction. On any day that anyone is assigned to remote instruction, that uses up one of your 20 days. So if you said two or three, if you have many schools and two or three schools entirely because of shortages are gonna be put on remote instruction for one given day. So five schools on one Thursday or remote instruction, that's one of your 20 days. If just one school in your district goes on remote instruction or even one classroom on a given Thursday, that's one of your 20 days. And so last night, this got so confusing that I almost thought of it myself as making an old construction paper loop chain like I was uh, my daughter's age. Any you have 20 loops on this chain any day that anyone in your district is using remote instruction, you cut off one of those loops until you're out, uh, with, out of your 20 days. This, this 20 days in this program is totally separate than all of your 10 NTI days that are for the entire district closing, whether it's for COVID or any other reason, flood, uh, roof leak, or inclement weather. So altogether, you'll have the same 10 NTI days if you haven't used any yet, and then this 20 days. And I said, this, this group of 20 days only goes until December 31st, 2021. As you can see at the top of your screen there, students on this remote instruction shall receive at least the minimum daily instruction equivalent required under statute. And then you can see there, remote instruction under this section shall not be counted against the student attendance days under your NTI plan um, if you use any of those. So conceivably between now and December 31st, your school district could entirely close and use 10 NTI days. Then on different days between now and December 31st, Various groups from classrooms to grades to entire schools could use 20 remote instruction days at any point on any given 20 days, so long as the entire district all at once is not put on remote instruction. Of course, that is not quite as flexible as we thought that the words were going to be originally when we first read them. Of course, it could always be more days or more flexible. There was, suffice to say, without going on too long, last night, Late all the way up to midnight, there was a lot of discussion on this, a lot of emails and phone calls, a lot of debates in the House and the Senate about what the number of days should be and how it should exactly work. And as I said, we just want to focus you on what the current rule is right now to focus on what ended up passing and what is in place now. This is definitely more flexibility than we had before the special session started on Tuesday. Uh, this category of 20 days working this way is absolutely more than we had without it. Uh, which is going to be more flexibility that might help some districts. There again, you don't have to use this at all. It is entirely permissible, um, and you can make it work um, as much as possible flexibly in your district. Okay, moving on now, Section 6 of Senate Bill 1 talks about the uh, average daily attendance, ADA, which is tied, of course, to the state seat funding you will receive from the state. 
This is probably, honestly, the most impactful, perhaps the most important part of the bill in terms of just school operations and some of the concerns we had. When we get the, when this passed, this in many indirect ways will impact a lot of decisions you're making now and all the way to the end of the school year, even to the point of if you close for any days this year and you, you're out of NTI days, you're out of remote instruction days, and you still have to close, and then you're just making those up at the end of the year the way we did before NTI even existed. Um, towards the end of the year, if you're making up days and you're afraid now at the front end, well, attendance might be bad if it's in the middle of June. You know, that's going to hurt us on funding later. This provision will even help you on those concerns now. This says, for school year 21-22, school districts may, let me just highlight it all, may, when submitting your superintendent's annual attendance report, substitute attendance data for school year 1819 or 1920 for the attendance data actually being counted this year. Then that will be what they use calculating your funding going forward. As you know, you're all familiar with this. We've already done this basically kind of for two school years in a row. So when you turn in your data, your average daily attendance data for who's coming to school during the day this year, you can instead use what the actual attendance data was from the 1819 or the 1920 school year that will be the basis then for the money you actually receive from the state during the school year next year, because it always lags by a year. That uh, was very important. That was something everyone agreed on from the governor to the department, all of the K groups and everyone on down. We had a lot of legislative support for that. That Knowing that and having that certainty now is so important for districts in planning all of their operational issues. That was incredibly important. Of course, it says there, Compulsory attendance requirements still apply and all of the rules about truancy and absenteeism still apply, of course. Of course, you still have to count your actual attendance, even if you actually submit data from another year. And at the top of your screen now, you can see it says the intent of the General Assembly is to enact legislation in the 2022 general session starting in January to address the adjustment of these seek numbers for any attendance growth. Basically, we didn't want to try to figure out how we could adjust for districts that are experiencing a lot of attendance growth. And the ADA numbers from two or three years ago are so much lower than what you have now. The General Assembly is completely supportive of doing something to adjust for that for those growth districts. But it was going to be a tall order to try to figure out exactly the right way, the best way to do that in the middle of the special session. So they wanted to clearly say that they will be talking about that between now and January and probably do something, maybe even part of the budget bill next session. Okay, wrapping up, it won't take much longer. Uh, section seven on your screen now, when a school district uses a student attendance day under an NTI plan due to COVID-19 or utilizes the remote instruction that we just talked about, all certified staff and any classified staff designated by the district shall be required to perform work duties on site during the student attendance day unless an employee is quarantined due to COVID-19 um, and they can determine that you can work remotely. Okay, there's very important words here to keep in mind. The due to COVID-19, we believe, and this was explained last night, this means that effective immediately, if your district uses an NTI day because of COVID-19, for some reason, whether it's staff or student shortages or whatnot, if it's tied to COVID-19 and not bad weather, then basically most of your staff will have to do their work on site that day. In short, your teachers will be teaching from their normal classrooms, um, we assume. A lot of discussion went into why that was. Some of the legislators said that, of course, we still have a lot of bandwidth problems and internet uh, connectivity issues in some parts of the state, urban and rural. Uh, we know that over the past year and a half, when a lot of districts were using virtual learning, that sometimes the, the service would cut out, it would be spotty. And because of all the investments we've made for over 30 years in our school buildings, there is really, really great internet service in most cases. And it's definitely going to be better most of the time than um, many people working from home. That was one big issue that was discussed yesterday. Uh, a lot of teachers, frankly, have said at various times over the pandemic that they would just as they would rather work from their classrooms because that's where all their materials are and that's where um, everything is that they need. So that is part of why this is here. This applies for NTI days or the remote instruction days we talked about. 
so long as it's due to COVID-19, which both of those would be. If you use NTI, especially when winter comes, for a, just for inclement weather, basically it's like a snow day, it's not safe for anyone to be on the roads. If you use NTI that day, that is not due to COVID-19, so this would not apply at all and your staff would not be having to try to drive over the snow-covered roads to, to work from the building. Section eight talks about, um, gives us some flexibility on employees. It says for this school year, so this does not end in January or December, for this entire school year, a local school district may employ individuals to serve as short-term or long-term substitute teachers under this section. This sort of changes some of the, uh, the eligibility rules and the uh, qualifications for substitute teachers. An individual, as you can see on the words there near the top, an individual must comply with the background checks required later in the bill and have at least 64 hours of college credit or a high school diploma or equivalent with four years of work experience in education, child care, or the subject area being taught. So that or means either one of those. So now you might, we believe this is very important, no one has enough substitute teachers we believe this may help you to recruit some additional substitute teachers because now they just need 64 hours of college credit or high school diploma or equivalent and four years of that relevant work experience. If you hire anyone during the school year under those provisions, as you see there, they must apply for a one-year emergency sub certification from EPSD and the school district may employ them prior to actually receiving the certificate if all the other requirements are met. Near the top there, for this entire school year, you may fill certified positions, notwithstanding the vacancy process requirements under those laws, basically notwithstanding the time limits and the posting requirements because of the shortages and we need to get as many people as possible working as teachers and substitute teachers. Uh, there you see, notwithstanding any other laws, for this school year, classified staff employed by the school district may perform classroom instructional duties without, I'll highlight this, without direct supervision by certified staff. There you see that highlighted language again. So for this entire school year, the bill is in effect now, classified staff um, as of today may perform classroom instructional activities without direct supervision of the certified staff. Going up, yeah, another similar rule, for the entire school year, home hospital instruction may be provided by classified staff employed by the district as of today. Now, this is all about background checks. They're subsection five at the top of the screen. For this entire school year, beginning now, compliance background checks under the law that are normally required are still required. However, a superintendent, beginning here, a superintendent may employ all individuals on a probationary status upon receiving a preliminary background check from the Administrative Office of the Courts, or AOC. That is basically the staff of our state court system. There are several different background check systems and databases that we're talking about here. What this basically means is the requirements for the state and federal background check when you employ people that involves a fingerprint and the FBI doing a national check and the state police doing a check, that is still required. You still have to submit that at the same time you would submit it when you hire someone. However, there is sometimes a backlog on getting those back. Once you submit that, as you normally would, even before you get the result back, so long as you receive the AOC, the state court system background check, uh, you can go ahead and have that person begin working on a probationary status. That is very good for us because of two primary reasons. One, those checks are usually much faster. They are all online. They do not involve a fingerprint. You can usually get them back in one or two business days. Um, they are less expensive. I believe the AOC just charges school districts $10 per check. The staff at the AOC has been absolutely phenomenal. They reached out to us and KASS a couple of days ago as soon as they saw this language. They have already created a very simple one-page document explaining how to use the system, how a district can set up a school district account to submit them and to pay for them and to get the results back. It is a very simple one page explanation showing how you do that, how you create the account, ask for the checks, how you interpret and how you read what the check comes back and what it looks like. 
Many school districts already have an account for the AOC checks for your volunteers, but some do not. So we, as part of this information coming to you today, we will be sharing those guidance documents from AOC so that this can work as smoothly and quickly as possible for all of you and for AOC getting a lot more checks. And ultimately, so that we can get people uh, safely reviewed and hired and on staff in our schools. Quickly now at the top of your screen, the state police and the cabinet for health and family services have to prioritize your school hiring background checks for this school year, even before other employment agencies doing the similar checks. That talks about the child abuse and neglect registry check, as well as the criminal background check, which of course, as I said, those still have to happen. And there you see nothing in this can be interpreted to waive any requirements under the federal IDEA law, uh, which of course I don't believe it could. You can't, uh, the state cannot waive a federal law. Okay, section nine of the bill talks about retired employees coming back to work. This is very important for us to recruit and bring back some of our retired teachers and classified staff to start as quickly as possible to help with our shortages. This is important for the time period occurring on or after the effective date of this act, which is today, and until only January 15, 2022. For that window of time, these are the rules that will apply for how quickly someone who's retired can come back to work um, and kind of how their compensation will work. And so during that period of time from today until January 15th, the following rules apply for retirees who retired from the TRS system on or before August 1st, and who subsequently return to employment for a local school board full-time or part-time teaching position or providing substitute teaching services. The separation of service required must be at least one month for retirees returning to work full-time, part-time, or substitute. So if you hire back a retired teacher, they have to still stay out at least one month this paragraph highlighted there changes the critical shortage program. You will now be able to hire more of your district employees, your full district teaching staff under the critical shortage program than you were otherwise. I believe there was a limit of 3% of your teaching staff in the district could be in this program. They have raised that now to a maximum of 10% of your total active members. In other words, we think that basically you'll probably be able to hire more retired folks under this bill than you could before this bill passed, which is very important. All of the other rules, other than these specific changes, all the other rules in the statute about return to work limits and compensation still apply. The provisions of this section expire on January 15th. As soon as that day comes, any future reemployment or ongoing employment of these people. In other words, after January 15th, the rules for how you hire at that point, any retired folks to come back to work, or any people that you hire under this provision right now, if they continue working for you, that is the ongoing reemployment of retirees that you see highlighted there. It says um, after January 15th, for such future or ongoing reemployment after that date, um, basically all of the rules come back into force. In other words, this window of time closes and all of the existing limitations uh, come back into force. You can see there additional cost incurred to school districts for the hiring of critical shortage teachers under this uh, can be paid, we believe, with federal funds, federal COVID relief funds that you may receive. And this just says if any of this is ever found to be in conflict with federal law, they will tell school districts that, the, that it is now determined to be in conflict so that you know basically that we can't do it any longer at that point if that happens. Section 10 is basically almost exactly the same types of rules for classified employees. Uh, of course, your classified folks are in the CERS pension system. Basically, as you read through the section 10, this is almost all of the same provisions and flexibility for hiring classified employees who have retired to come back, um, who are classified in that other pension system. Okay, we're almost finished. Section 11, as you see there, for, the, for this entire school year, a school district may revise its annual school calendar to basically add time to each school day in order to have fewer student attendance days for the entire year. This law has already been on the books for a number of years. Some districts have already taken advantage of it to have uh, up to seven hours of student instruction per day 
so that you get the number of hours that you have to have for a year on fewer than 170 days. Uh, otherwise, you have to have under law, you have to have at least 1,062 instructional hours given on at least 170 different attendance days. Some school districts already take advantage of this, but there's a deadline for you to basically do so before the year begins. This language will allow any district who does, did not already decide to do that who wants to, you do not have to, if you want to make all of your days a little bit longer so that you might have fewer student attendance days for the whole year, you can now do so even though we have passed the deadline. It says there uh, a day, as you spent the middle of your page there where I'm highlighting now, a school day shall not exceed seven hours of instructional time unless you have been approved by the Commissioner of Education for an innovative alternative calendar. You cannot have student instructional days on Saturdays. And as always, you can have at the end of the school year, you can have graduation ceremonies for high school before the last student attendance day. So this is very important. This is another piece of flexibility when we're talking about having difficulty getting enough staff to have in-person school on any given day. Really the idea is on any day that you can get enough bus drivers, enough teachers and classified staff in the building to have in-person school, you might decide at the local school board level, we should take advantage of that any day that we're all here, get as many instructional hours done that day as possible so that at any point leading up to the end of the school year, if we have other days that we have to close, if we have to close for days and we've already used our NTI days and our remote instruction days, and then we just have to close, then we'll have to start making those days up at the end of the year. If you do this, you're just trying to get to 1,062 instructional hours. So this could, in some cases, allow a district to have between 15 and up to even 20 fewer student attendance days during the school year. There was a lot of discussion about this with legislators last night with 10 NTI days, 20 remote instruction days, and possibly up to maybe 20 days that you don't have to go if all of your days are a little bit longer, that is a lot of time that you might be able to have instruction happening um, without everyone in the building on days that you can't have everyone in the building without also going to school very late in the next summer. There it talks about if you want to take advantage of this, you simply have to sort of reach out and contact the Department of Ed uh, for approval, and you have to describe kind of what your new calendar looks like. And of course, all of your, there at the top of your screen, all of your personnel have to still complete all of their contact contract days of employment um, by either work, professional development, or other work duties. And then at the end, the emergency clause that basically says this takes effect upon becoming a law, which is uh, today, Friday. Well, I'm sorry that video went much longer than I wanted to, but there was a lot packed into that bill to go through. There is no substitute, no, there is no substitute at all for just reading the bill. So we wanted to put the words up on the screen in front of you and go through it. Uh, a link that opens up that version of the bill, the one that is in effect now is going to be part of this communication that we send out to you. So you can open that up and read through it as you watch the video and in the days ahead. Uh, as you work, more than anything, the thing getting the most attention now, of course, is the mask issue and also the quarantine rules. And so keep in mind that the state mask mandate will stay in effect exactly as it is, at least I believe until Thursday of next week. Uh, many school districts have already announced that they are just reverting back. We were at least about 50 school districts were already doing a local mask mandate even before this anyway, that they will just revert back to without doing anything. Districts have a lot of flexibility on this now. Uh, school boards can have a meeting and vote to do one thing or another. You can put your own parameters around it. You can vote to just say, well, we'll have universal masking in our district. If our county is at a certain point on the incidence rate map, uh, you can meet with your local health department. In fact, please do meet with your local hospital and doctors. You can work out your own metrics and plan for whether you'll do masking or not or when. Ultimately, as I said before, you know, reach out to your staff, your families, your school board council, your insurance provider, your potentially your workers comp provider and discuss this with them. Take all of those factors into account on this, what could be a very complicated uh, decision. Uh, but as you do so on that and the quarantine rules, be on the lookout for the state guidance on the test to stay model and what that might look like to help you if you're interested in doing that. And reach out above all with your local health department to talk about what your quarantine plan and your contact tracing plan may look like now going forward with this new language. We hope going through this bill has helped. We will continue tracking all of this. if. 
there's some discussion that some groups may try to challenge parts of this bill in court. Uh, that's a lot, these days, many things are challenged in court. If any of that happens, and if any parts of this bill are uh, prevented from being implemented, if a court issues an injunction against anything, of course, we will communicate that with you quickly in the days ahead. So as always, stay in touch with KSBA for further developments. And thank you for sticking with your local school board service and leading your school districts ultimately so that we can support and educate all of the students of the Commonwealth, even though we know it is a very constantly overwhelming time. Uh, thank you so much for watching and good luck.